Good afternoon, everyone. Again, um, we have uh, Dr. Amy Lingo, who is the Dean of College of Education and Human Development, who is going to bring greetings to us this afternoon. Great. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us on this. Feels like it's a really uh, nice, warm, warmer day than what we have had. Um, over the last week or so. So thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us for this important um, session, speaker series, as we learn more about the Newcomer Academy and how important the Newcomer Academy is to our community. Um, I know that um, I appreciate Dr. Stark and her leadership in thinking about how we in the College of Education and Human Development at UofL can connect, can connect more intentionally to the community. And obviously, I know our faculty and staff and those that are joining us want to learn more about the Newcomer Academy and maybe how we can help support um, the efforts of the Newcomer Academy in making sure that the students there and how we just can enhance our knowledge. And so uh, thank you for sharing your expertise, those of you who are on the panel, and thank you, Dr. Stark, for your leadership so that we all can learn uh, more impact, more about the impact that, that, that we can make um, within the community. So thank you. Hey, thank you very much. Um, thank you for your leadership and the opportunity to lead the nice trends of excellence in education. Um, the the um, Newcomer Academy is near and dear to me because for many of us um, on this panel, we have um, had the luxury of being at Western um, High School. And Western, at Western High School, we had like the first Newcomer Academy, where we had about 150 students from about 25 different countries. And the great thing about this is that to be able to see the leadership continue to expand because I was the principal over there and now Gwen Snow and Rebecca Merkel and Rita were, were teachers there. And to now see them in the leadership roles, um, it just warms my heart that we continue the legacy of taking care of the, um, the newcomer students because many times people don't even know who they are. And in many school districts across the country, as in JCBS, they say, oh, well, there's a newcomer academy. Hmm, we're gonna approve it. What does that mean? Okay, and then what happens after that? Who is the leadership team? What are they working on? What are the outcomes? What are they doing for students? Well, how are they working with community? How are they working with parents? And sometimes we don't ever hear about anything, any of those things. So I thought it was important that the ESL Newcomer Academy come and talk about the leadership and the great things that's happening you know, at the Newcomer Academy that the community doesn't know. And I could assure you probably many people in JCPS, you know, probably don't know either. They just like, it's those people over there, you know, and not really, you know, and I think they're, don't, they mean well, but they just don't know, you know? And so I thought it was important to be able to showcase this. And I also want you all to know that all of the series, speaker series are recorded. So for those individuals who can't attend, they are always able to go and access the videos later on. And for many of the in, um, instructors in, at higher ed, they're using it in their classrooms. And I encourage them to use it in their classrooms because as we are preparing teachers for the classes they're walking in, they need to know that JCPS is more than 53% students of color. They need to know what the ESL Academy, ESL Newcomer Academy is. They need to know about the various initiatives that's happening in Jefferson County Public Schools. So <clears throat> it is important that, they're, um, that you all are here today um, because um, people need to know exactly what's going on. And I believe in, in showcasing excellence. And I believe you know, in you all and the work that you are doing at the Newcomer Academy. So with that being said, <clears throat> we're gonna first um, go around and do introductions. And I want you to introduce yourself and talk about you know, how long you've been at the Newcomer Academy, your role there, and also some of the great things that's happening at the Newcomer Academy. We're gonna start with Principal Gwen Snow, who was a teacher at Western High School in the Newcomer Academy. So, yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Um, yes, I'm Gwen Snow. I've been with JCPS for um, 
think this is 23 years. This is my 24th year. I'm losing track. It's enough, enough years and not quite not far enough that I'm not sure in between there. Um, but I started out as a new teacher at Western. Um, I was um, an art and uh, an art and ESL teacher at Western. Um, I also did my student teaching way back at Western. Um, so really learned a lot there and also from my colleagues there. I've been the principal of the Newcomer Academy. This is my 13th year here at the Newcomer Academy as the print or the resource teacher as a leader and then evolved into the principal as we grew and grew and grew. Um, before that though, I was um, an art teacher, arts and humanities, Spanish, ESL, um, and resource teacher for JCPS. Thank you very much. Um, we're gonna go with um, Rita Robinson. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Rita Robinson. I'm a counselor uh, on the high school side at Newcomer Academy. I've been with JCPS for about 23, 24 years, uh, nine of that in the classroom as a classroom teacher, two years as a resource, and the remainder of that in the role of counselor. And I've been at Newcomer for about five years. Thank you. Dr. McGrath. Hi, I'm Irina McGrath, and uh, this is my 20th year with JCPS. I was an ESL teacher at Thomas Jefferson Middle School, and then I went to work for the district as an ESL uh, resource teacher for a very short period of time. I worked for Kentucky Department of Education, and then I came to Newcomer last year as an AP, and I was hired on March 8th, which is the International Women's Day. <laughs> so. Oh, wonderful. Hmm. Absolutely. Um, Rebecca Merkel? Hi, I'm Rebecca Merkel. I was hired into JCPS in 2000 by uh, Dr. Stark and was K-tipped by the fantastic Rita Robinson, who I get to collaborate with every day and work beside my principal, Gwen Snow. So I'm very, very fortunate. Um, I have been uh, at Western High School, Iroquois High School, a very brief stint at the TAP program, which is a really powerful program as well. And then joined this team as a college access resource teacher before becoming an assistant principal. And this is my fourth year as an assistant principal at Newcomer, and it is the best place to work in JCPS. Absolutely. Um, Ms. Hankins? Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Felicia Hankins. I've been an administrator with the district for 24 years. Mm -hmm. The last eight of those years, I've been a high school counselor um, at Newcomer, and before I was a frisky coordinator the oh. previous years for elementary mm -hmm. school. And luckily, uh, Gwen Snow's grandchildren went to a school I was working for, so she I think she recognized my name and gave me an interview <laughs> and I've been with a newcomer and I love it there ever since. It's a great reference. So <laughs> <laughs> nothing like asking grandchildren about a reference. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, Alethea Victor. Mm -hmm. Name's Alethea Victor and this is my fourth year at, at Newcomer Academy. And um, I'm in my 15th year working with JCPS, and I was a Youth Serve Center coordinator at Liberty High School, and, um, and also worked with pupil personnel after that as a certified school social worker. And that's when I had the beautiful opportunity of discovering this wonderful school and doing some volunteer work um, during some advisory classes with kids, and then came on board as a middle school counselor. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much um, for the introductions. Um, you all were very brief, you know. But um, we're going to start. We're going to we're going to start talking. Miss um, Snow, tell us about the Newcomer Academy and why is it in place? Uh, why was it why was it necessary? So um, I'll put some visual prompts up here too. Um, so Newcomer Academy started. We had different variations throughout JCPS for probably over the past 20 years, you know, including especially starting up at Western High School over 20 years ago. Um, but about 15 years ago, the district realized, you know, recognizing the needs to maximize resources throughout this big district. JCPS has about almost 100,000 students. So you can imagine the resources we have throughout the district, instead of spreading out um, hard to come by resources that support ELs throughout all the high schools, if you pull them together, those teachers and staff have a chance to work together and collaborate together instead of being isolated 
and siloed in different buildings. So all of a sudden, if you have a team of 10 teachers like we had at Western, um, and now we have 45 teachers, they're able to work in professional learning communities and focus on the needs of their students. We have counselors that can really focus on the needs of our students and provide wraparound services. We have a Frisky on site. We have a mental health practitioner, a nurse. Everything is about the needs of our international students and our newcomers. Um, so we can really focus on their needs and, and they don't get left behind. Um, so 15 years ago, it was pulling that together and, and creating a specific school, a cost center that was the Newcomer Academy. We started out um, at Shawnee High School on the third floor of the new side, I guess, um, which on the Market Street side where there was some space. We started out with about, I think that first year, um, about 150 students. Uh, we grow over the course of the year. We start with our students at the beginning of the year. They're all beginners, um, high school and middle school age, and they're beginning English learners, and they're new to the United States. And they stay with us through the end of the school year and transition out over the, or over the summer to now it's their reside school um, when they're prepared. And we'll talk a little bit more about that transition process. Um, but you can imagine if they're staying with us all year and transition out at the end of the year, we grow. So we typically double in size over the course of the year, um, depending on you know, just kind of what's going on. But typically it's about um, doubling in size. So that first year we started, you know, we ended up with about 200 students and just have gradually grown and grown and grown. Um, currently we have over 700 students. We started with 350. We're growing really fast this year. Um, I'm sure we're going to add another 100 by the end of the year. This week, we just added 24 students to give you an example. This is kind of a peak week, but um, we, you know, we grow pretty quickly. Um, so that's how we got started, basically, uh, maximizing those resources. As we grew, we outgrew the space in Shawnee, and then also, of course, Shawnee outgrowing, you know, needing more space as well, um, and looking at the needs of our students where they're all over the district and making sure that they have better access to, you know, physically to the building. Um, so uh, over the course of kind of growing and growing, four years ago, three and a half years ago, um, we were, we had classes in the the old Myers middle, middle School building shared with Phoenix um, and the district kind of right-sized those buildings and moved Phoenix to a space that fit their needs more. Um, and we took over this building here. So we are in the old Myers Middle School now and it's completely our campus and it helps us to definitely create a sense of identity within the community um, and, a, and a space. So we're a unique school just for the needs of newcomers um, here. Now, when you say newcomers, I mean, I know, but to your audience, what does newcomer mean and where are many of these students coming from? So a newcomer um, is a student that is uh, new to the United States, typically in their first year of being in the United States. They're also, in our definition, um, a beginning English learner as well. So if you take the access, the WIDA access test, it's uh, below a 2.0, which means they're beginning. They're just learning. They might know a few phrases or no English at all. Those are our students. Um, so, and they're all in our school, their ages, um, sixth grade through all the way up to 21 year olds. We, we are graduating students now, so. Okay. Ms. Robinson. Oh, and they're also, I'm sorry, the, where they're coming from, uh, we reflect the diversity of Louisville itself, um, and especially students that, there's some students that are coming as immigrants, and maybe their parents are going to work at UofL or have a, a job at GE, and they've been planning to come, and those students might have had the chance to, to practice English and learn English, and they might test out of being recommended for newcomer and just go straight into a JCPS school. With they, They'll still continue to have ESL support but um, not quite the extensive services that we have. But our largest populations right now, um, definitely Guatemalan, um, Cuban, and Congolese. I think those are our top threes. Um, and we are becoming known for um, just like a center for those areas basically in, in the country, basically. So um, lots of Congolese leadership in our, in our community. And so more and more Congolese are um, if they move to a different part of the country, they're relocating here um, or coming here directly from the refugee camps um, in Central Africa, um, also Central America. Um, we have students that are the nieces and nephews 
of students we had at Western and they're coming here, um, you know, and so we get to see them. Um, and then also Louisville is very dynamic uh, Cuban community and that is steadily growing even more. It's one of the largest Cuban communities in the nation actually, so. Okay, good deal. Um, Ms. Robinson, as we talk about, I mean, secession, you know, that um, students come in from all over, what about the parent parental engagement? How do you engage parents who may not know the language? Uh, what happens with that? What is that process? Well, prior to COVID, uh, we held a lot of on-campus uh, events from, uh, uh, you know, uh, dinners where students would showcase their science work uh, from events held outside uh, on the uh, school campus where students and families would come and learn more about the, uh, the school. Since COVID though, however, we've been meeting the needs of parent engagement through our town hall meetings. Mm -hmm. And uh, that has proved uh, productive in uh, helping to establish relationships with uh, families and uh, the community. Mm -hmm. I know, you know that, the, uh, go ahead. I was going to say, in addition to that, we also uh, make use of the community partnerships and stakeholders that we have through uh, uh, Kentucky Refugee Ministry, Catholic Charities, uh, La Casita, uh, the C Forward uh, Ministry that operates out of uh, Butchel United Methodist Church, uh, where they'll uh, come in and provide provide support in different programs for our kids and families. And that, that's what I was going to ask, you know, because with the um, Catholic Charities and um, Kentucky Refugee, you know, then I know they bring in a lot of immigrants from across the country. Do they, how do they connect with, with you all? How do they connect? Or is there someone at these agencies that connect them with Newcomer Academy? Uh, at times there are, at, at, at times uh, it is us recognizing uh, those needs and reaching out to the uh, families. Uh, one of the things that we focus on here is providing wraparound uh, services for students. Uh, that involves taking a team approach where we, the counselor and the AP, meet with our uh, team teachers weekly, discuss vitals and, uh, you know, uh, issues that we feel like we need to address to help the student be successful. Miss mm -hmm. um, Victor, you know, as the, the middle school counselor, you know, what is, um, what is some of the work that you're doing, some of that you, um, your area in terms of just your duties and responsibilities at the Newcomer Academy. Um, because I know that even though sometimes people have services, but sometimes connecting is the key because so many times across the country or even in our community, people ask why they don't have these services. They do, but, but being, being able to make the connection is always a challenge. So, how do you, I know that you're middle school, so you're gonna see them before they get to high school. How does that work in your world? Making the connections with, with both students and with their families as well is very important to building that rapport with the families and their students to help the students to succeed. And so as a middle school counselor, I spend a lot of time with the students individually, one-on-one, -on -one. they're coming with a lot of trauma and, um, they're faced with a lot of obstacles and challenges. And so being able to be available to them, to talk with them, to discuss their needs, to find out what are the supports that they need to wrap around them and to wrap around their families is very important. And if we're able to address their social, emotional 
needs, then they'll be better ready and able to learn within the classroom. But without that, it makes it very challenging for them. And as an example, I have a student that I've been working with for the past three years who came in with very many challenges and a lot of behavioral issues. And I mean, it was every day, every day within the APs office, the front office with the security guards and, and myself. And the student came, they were, they were just so frustrated and just so angry and fighting. And it was just so hard for them. But to see the growth within that student now that's in the eighth grade, who now recognizes the challenges that they had, who is now just succeeding at such high levels of excellency. And to see now that student be able to be a mentor to a younger student and pull back and reach and grab that other student who's going through the same challenges is what we do. And that is what, to me as a middle school counselor is what's really important is to see that kind of growth within a student in a social emotional way. Besides all the other things like scheduling and looking at the transcripts and look and preparing them, it's just seeing that personal growth within them internally that will help them in their future, you know, as they progress through through their high school years and preparing them for that, just getting their mindset ready for that, just helping them with their social emotional. So that is the kind of work that I really like to see as a middle school counselor and continuing helping the students to grow social emotionally and also helping the students to have a sense of belonging in the school is very important to me because if they don't feel like they belong, then it affects their learning. And so that is another thing that I tackle as a middle school counselor is making sure that all students, even though we are working with um, marginalized communities that are minorities, but being able to ensure that every single student that walks into that building, no matter where they come from, no matter what language they speak, that they belong there within the school. One of the things that you, um, right now has become a buzzword trauma and people, and you say they're coming in with trauma, you know, then you are Ms. Merger can, what, what does that look like? Because for the people we've heard so much of, they're coming in with trauma, their social mm -hmm. emotional um, learning or they socially emotionally just unraveled. So what does that mean to the people who don't know what that means? And what does that look like? Mm -hmm. The trauma, it can look like they may have been sexually abused. Um, a lot of the different types of abuse, emotional abuse, maybe sexually abuse. It could be that they have, were lacking um, resources within their own countries, not having adequate food, adequate shelter, an adequate place where they feel safe. There may be violence within their communities that they've experienced that they are fleeing and trying to look for a safe, a safe haven, a safe place that they can, you know, really call home. Uh, trauma of not getting an education and because we have students that um, are have many years of interrupted learning and so that's trauma in the sense of even their education not being able to have access to to that kind of resource being separated by their families um, due to you know many different problems that are going on within their communities and so traveling here on their own with a friend, a family member, or on their own, mm -hmm. as young as little kids to, mm -hmm. you know, the oldest that we serve within our schools, on their own, leaving their parents behind. So that's, that's trauma, mm -hmm. and it's heavy. Mm -hmm. And so they bring that with them, but they thrive, and they're resilient, they're able to work through. So being mm -hmm. able to work through all of that, uh, you know, that's, that's trauma, being able to help them work through all of that so that they can be ready to learn within our school system. It's very challenging, but they're able to thrive through with the wraparound supports that we give them and their families. Wonderful. And that's what I want people to know and understand, because again, the word trauma has been, has been bounced around so much yes. that sometimes people become immune to it. Oh, well, trauma, everybody has trauma, but what, you know, and thank you for sharing what does that mean? What does that look like? Because then it gives people an idea of if you're traveling from a whole nother country by yourself at five, six, seven years old and, and you're separated from your family. I mean, how do you even have the wherewithal to even go forward? And 
So we know kids in this country, mm -hmm. they'll be crying at 15, where's my mommy? You know, right. these people have traveled, you know, across um, waters to get here. Yeah. Right. Ms. Ms. Hankins, talk about your work as a, as a high school counselor, some of the things that you do, some of the work that you do to help those um, newcomer students. Well, um, a lot of the things that I do, uh, like high school scheduling and transcripts and things like that, the normal uh, things that high school counselors have to do, um, also work with children um, when they're having problems in their classroom or with their teachers. And yet with bringing that trauma, that creates, I mean, when someone's been living on their own for so long, then all of a sudden they have all these rules they got to follow. They have a problem with that. <laughs> but um, we help them to become good community members. Um, I'm the master, master scheduler. I do the lead report. I'm the back. Um, I help the students, well, Reed and I, we work very closely together. We work together to help the students with their individual learning plan. And um, I am the first person that the students see, will talk to because I um, schedule all the brand new students. Um, so they'll come to the cafeteria and then I'll get them in their classes. And then they're in their welcome strand for a couple of days. And that's where we do some testing on them to see where they are um, with their English or with their math. And then uh, after the second day, uh, we schedule them to go into the classrooms in their, where they'll be for the rest of the year in their cohort. And sometimes uh, students bring um, transcripts from their country. And so we give them credits, but uh, sometimes kids have gone to school in their country but they have no transcripts. They have no way to prove that they've been educated. And here they have to go four years to be able to get a degree after they've already been in school. So with those kind of students, um, when if they score high enough in their second level courses, a C or higher, we can give them some credits even though they don't have proof of um, being in high school. Well, great, that's it because if I've already completed high school in my country, but I don't have, I had to leave in a hurry, you know, then I may not have a transcript and no one is even thinking about a transcript. <laughs> so exactly. they're just trying to get to a safe place, you know, and being able to um, get there. But, and also for the Newcomer Academy, the leadership there to be able to understand that even though they have done a transcript, let's find a way to evaluate their, their level of education. Right. Ms. Merkel, you know, um, talk about your work, you know, as a, um, you know, as an assistant principal. And we know that, and, and when we were talking, I know we have the basic things that you all do, you know, discipline, those kind of different things, but we talk about the, the nitty gritty thing. We talk about the stuff that makes the Newcomer Academy different than any other high school because your population is different. So, mm -hmm. so I'm gonna piggyback a little bit off of what um, Alethea said and uh, as well as Rita, one of the things that's very, very special is the, the partnership that we create to create those wraparound services. So each week, Rita and I meet to talk about our students, the students we share, because we're sort of set up, um, we're set up in almost like middle school teams. Our teachers share a common interdisciplinary PLC, because part of being an assistant principal is that instructional leadership, right? So we, over time, have developed a system where our students uh, share a common group of, you know, teachers that sort of wrap around to help with moving them forward in language development because we teach uh, language through the lens of content. So they work together to help students move forward with their English language acquisition, also academically. So we meet together, Alethea and I meet together for middle school uh, students that we share in sixth and eighth grade, and then Felicia and uh, Irina do, do the same thing for their students. So that wraparound piece is something that we're able to provide here that may look similar to what you see in some of those academy programs um, in mainstream schools. But as Alethea said, the high level of trauma, all of our students um, are experiencing uh, unprecedented trauma, right? They, they're new to the United States, new language, learning a new system. And oftentimes um, their behaviors are a manifestation of need. Okay, so some need is not being met. Uh, they don't have the language necessarily to express it or the cultural piece to latch onto. And so they will like all high school students have some of those behavioral concerns, but we are uh, committed to being a 
Positive Behavior Intervention School, which is a PIBA school. I believe we were one of the first PIBA schools, if I'm, if I'm not wrong, Gwen. I, I think we were one of the very first. Iroquois had been doing that when I came on board. We, we were doing it here. And what that means is we have a very clear and concise, simple set of expectations. We have three expectations. Respect yourself, respect others, and respect our school. And we anchor our students to those expectations and coach them up, just like in any other school. But it may take many, many times and many explanations and many um, opportunities to interact with those expectations and model them. And as uh, you know, Alethea shared, maybe partner them with someone who can help them sort of see what it looks like. Um, like we all should be doing, we don't just jump to consequences. We really are about teaching kids. So being a positive behavior intervention school is one. We are also uh, very proud of our commitment to being a restorative practice school. So um, our counselors worked together and brought in some training several years back. I think this is probably our fourth or fifth year as an what does that what, the, what does that mean, restorative practice, for those for the audience who may not know what that means? Rita, you want to jump in on that one because you speak so well, you know, about RP. I, I, we do it, but I want her to talk about it. Uh, what that looks like is sort of meeting the student where they're at uh, and being able to use experiences or incidences that they are currently going through in the moment as a teachable moment before immediately jumping to consequences. Uh, sometime depending upon the behavior of the incidences, consequences, you know, uh, have to be a result. But in those times when the student uh, returns to us, we make an effort to incorporate them back into the school community, realizing that, uh, you know, that one incident or event doesn't describe who that student is as a, uh, as a person. So um, just maybe two or three weeks ago, the, the time is blending, you guys. COVID makes, you know, an NTI makes the time get kind of wonky, and then we had holidays. So Alethea alluded to a student that's an eighth grader now, and I'm going to take it back to the student being mentored. It's nice to be able to have the opportunity to bring it full circle. So we have a student in the sixth grade that are, you know, a highly traumatized young man. Mom has been here. We've talked many times. We have built a positive relationship. We work together with mom. Um, but his manifestation of need is returning to some practices that were familiar to him where he came from, which is oftentimes putting hands on other people. He, he puts hands on people, he, and it's sometimes not friendly, and he has lots. So as a, as a team, we've worked together to do some of that PEBUS work. He has a place where he can step to the side and take some deep breaths. There's a safe space in every classroom. He's assigned to a teacher that he has chosen um, kind of as his safe space on his team. But even then, somebody might accidentally push their chair backwards, and, and he just can't take it. He puts hands. And of course, during, you know, as you all know, in the code of conduct, we start putting hands on people, you know, what do we go to? That's fighting. Fighting is a suspension. But because we've been able to build a restorative practice situation in our school, first, taking the teacher's safety and respecting that teacher, talking with the teacher first, say, I'd really like to debrief with this young man and see if we can repair harm because he does not want to behave this way. And if we continue to move him out, he's not going to feel safe and, and be able to reform his behavior. And long story short, we were able to do that, bring him back into the classroom. He was able to learn to apologize because again, this is not his first, first you know, rodeo with this, but he was able to have an opportunity to apologize to his classroom and to his classmates in a circle. They were able to talk about how we all make mistakes and we're like a family. Mm -hmm. And like family, we have good and bad, bad days and we don't shun people in our family when they make a mistake. We try to forgive and we bring them back in. And then the students verbally go around and welcome him back into the circle. And those practices are something that I think are, shouldn't be unique in JCPS. I don't know that they are, but they are very special because they model that sense of kindness and compassion for kids. So a lot of times being an AP here, and Dr. McGrath can speak to this, is really about using those trauma-informed practices in the classroom, setting up classrooms that feel safe, um, setting up procedures and protocols so we can wrap our arms around kids, giving them opportunities to repair harm, which means sometimes as adults, we have to swallow, you know, our pride and say, okay, we're going to do it. But as a result, um, we are able to have a low level of behavior referrals. Our behavior is low. And 
we are integrating and welcoming students to a safe and welcoming school and a safe and welcoming JCPS. We are their first impression of what school is. And if you are from a community, if a person is from a community where the school, and Dr. Price, Dr. Stark, I learned this from you, <laughs> if students have a negative impression of school or their parents have a negative or a, a distrust with the school system, it is our job to teach them to feel like this is a place that is collaborative and trusting. And if we can do that, we have won them over not only for our school and for their education, but for their next school and other experiences like this. And many of those students, you know, later when they leave, they, they don't want to go. They love it so much. Yeah, yeah. So we're very fortunate that our work looks very different in that regard. Mm -hmm. Very proud of that work. Very good. Dr. McGrath, you know, speak about your work and some of your, some of your highlights of the work that you're doing at the Newcomer Academy, because uh, again, um, it's about collaboration, it's about team, um, and it's, uh, it's clear that you are working as a team, and the team have many parts. So talk to us about your part. Yes, so Rebecca and I divide and conquer things here. So in addition to my um, regular things like housekeeping, I work with plant operator and custodials and cafeteria. I'm also a liaison between universities and Newcomer Academy for student field work placement, which is amazing. We get a lot of students here who get to see our teachers teach and learn from them, which I feel like is a great experience for students, U of L students, um, Indiana University Southeast. Um, my, um, what else I do here is I, um, and I love One of the things while, while, while you're thinking, I want you to, um, because sure. we need ESL um, students to become teachers. So yeah. please um, continue to plant that seed because yes, you have people that say, oh, well, you know, we need, uh, we need teachers of color, you know, and you have a golden opportunity um, to be able to shed light to them or to let them know we need you. We Absolutely. Need Absolutely. I agree with you 100%. Mm -hmm. So another, I, I'm yes, going to please. interrupt real quick. Dr. Stark, do we still have, is there an MTRP program still with UofL? Because we need to connect on that. Yes. Um, it's um, the fact we are getting ready to um, post for, a, uh, for the position now. Our person left and we're looking forward to the opportunity to be able to post uh, within the next couple of weeks the position. And that position falls under the nice train center. Yes. Mm -hmm. Very good. We'll, we'll be in touch. Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's excellent. Mm -hmm. So another work that I would love to highlight because I um, work with an amazing group of administrators and teachers. It's the work of the Racial Equity Committee here um, at New Karma Academy, and I'm chair of the committee. So um, the teachers here have done an amazing job with the um, um, in this field and with particular the R tool. And for those of you know, our participants who are not familiar with that terminology, R stands for affirming racial equity tool. So we have done some work there, including professional developments and also a tool that we de developed as a committee that we're using in our professional uh, learning committees, uh, PLCs to look at assessment um, through a different lens slightly to uh, look at feedback and data analysis, taking into consideration our students' backgrounds. Mm -hmm. so, you know, and, and, and I know you, you said you, are, you all are doing um, amazing work and that's wonderful because many times people think, oh, well, they're already of color. So there's no, they don't need to do anything else, you know, mm -hmm. and being able to highlight that, yes, in any situation, there needs to be um, equity, you know, needs to be addressed, whether it be um, cultural, whether it be socioeconomic, whether it be whatever it is, then there's still an opportunity um, to be able to look at things differently and to be able to look at, is everyone being treated equitably, you know? So, um, so again, great for, for that work with the Racial Equity Committee, because uh, I think we've we've highlighted the work that you all are doing there and it is amazing work and we thank you all for doing that because 
so many times people just think, oh, for an example, if someone is at a school that's predominantly black, oh, well, well, we don't need a racial equity committee. You know, all the students are students of color. Well, yes, we do, because there are other factors, you know, that's involved in that, you know, and people don't see it in, it's not just um, African-American students, but for all students. And I can tell you at our time at Western High School, there were some people that stated to me that, oh, well, you know, these kids are from Lake Dreamland. They're from PRP. Why are you worried about them? You know, why are you concerned about them? And for the people in this panel who know me, you know, I'm like, oh, no, that's not going to work here. You, 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 we, you know, we can't, you know, be in the same situation because all students matter. And we don't judge students by their zip codes or where they're coming from. And if you have that mindset, then this is not the place for you. You know, you can't, you can't stay here. <laughs> you know? and, and in that, you know, talk about all the different areas of the county where your students are coming from. And any one of you all can jump in on that. Well, I wanted to just sort of piggyback on the uh, last comment regarding uh, ensuring that there's equity uh, for students, even with a, within a building as diverse as uh, newcomer. And, uh, you know, we intentionally take a look at data, you know, for those gaps to see how we can, uh, you know, uh, decrease and eliminate them. Just uh, recently, Ms. Merkel did a staff presentation uh, around our Kenya Wanden uh, speakers. And upon uh, looking at that data, we're coming up with strategies and ways that we can meet the needs of those uh, students so that they feel a part of the newcomer uh, family and uh, you know progress at the same levels as the larger student body here. Thank you. What activities do you have at Newcomer Academy that students can be involved in? I was gonna bring up, um, this might fit into that, just one example. Uh, we just, as a counseling department, we just started a um, counselor student advisory committee to give students an opportunity to be able to give us feedback and um, hear their voice and give us the input that we need to improve our, our school mm -hmm. and to address any of the inequities that we may have. And so we've had students that from different backgrounds involved with that, and they've spoken up on things that we need to improve. And that's important because this is their school and um, we have to face it. And so the awesome uh, opportunity now is that because we have this equity, racial equity committee, and we've got you know, the staff and the administrators who are hearing this feedback from students. It's now being shared with now with the racial equity committee. So now it's being brought to the attention and it's now things are, you know, things are being done about it. their voices are being heard. And these mm -hmm. students are going to be meeting with us every month to be a part of that. They're giving feedback, they gave us suggestions. And um, so that's one way that students can be involved is through um, a committee like this so that we can get their feedback so we can improve um, equity for all the students that we serve. Very good. Well, as far as after school activities, we used to have the YMCA here, but when COVID happened, we lost the YMCA, but we had applied for a, a CLC grant. What does that stand for, Ms. Snow? 21st Century Community Learning Center. Center. Yes. So we have uh, after school programs with that grant. Um, that takes place Monday through Thursday. And uh, that even went through when we were on, when kids were at home, we were in uh, COVID, uh, they participated online through that program also. And Dr. Stark, you also asked about um, the, where our population is in Louisville. They truly are everywhere, uh, but our biggest population probably is the Iroquois Park area. We have a, a a big number of students that will transition to Iroquois, probably more than any other school, but they truly come from everywhere. And one of the great things that uh, JCPS did was we used to have just certain ESL schools. 
which wasn't really fair. And Rita can tell you about that. <laughs> um, and But now ESL is in every school. And so students can truly go to their reside school like everybody else when they leave Newcomer Academy. What is the process of <clears throat> leaving Newcomer Academy? Or how long do they stay there? Should that with the audience? Is there a time frame for them or what is that? What does that look like? Well, some of our students come with an interruption education and those students usually stay one to two years if they need it. If a student mm -hmm. scores a 2.1 or higher on the WIDA online test that we give three times a year or on the access test, they get to move on to their reside school. And they could also leave newcomer when they apply through the school's choice uh, time period, in October to December, if they get accepted to a school, whether they get a 2.1 or not, they get to go. So um, Ms. Snow could talk more about that, the transition. Yeah, so, um, yeah, we want to make sure when we send our students out to um, other schools in JCPS that they are prepared. They'll still continue to get ESL services, but it's not the extensive services that they have here at our school. Um, all of our teachers have an ESL endorsement or certification, and they're qualified in the content area. So we're you know, doing seven hours a day of really focused ESL. Um, but when they go out to other schools, like say Western or PRP or Iroquois, they might have one or two classes of ESL and then they're out in content classes. So we do wanna make sure that they're prepared um, to do that and be successful in those classes. Um, so we have, um, this year we started using the WIDA model online, which is fantastic. It really helps us to do progress monitoring, um, kind of like the map does. Um, it's just our students were so new to oral English that the map, we kind of, it wasn't too, helpful for us as far as doing progress monitoring and seeing growth. So the WIDA model has helped us to do that. We have a three assessments, um, fall and winter and spring that we do. And this winter assessment data that we did is fantastic. Um, we're just all hands on deck now um, as we see the growth of our students and are they reaching towards their goal and our school improvement plan goal of uh, you know, this 2.1 or higher to see that they're prepared and what kind of extra services do we need to provide for students that are not moving ahead. Um, so right now it's a flurry of lots of activity and teachers planning and doing um, extra interventions during their class or do we need to do you know, extra things after school or whatever supports that we can give. Um, so transition helps to guide all of that. Um, to make sure that our students can get out into the regular JCPS classes and graduate from JCPS schools, um, take advantage of the Academies of Louisville programs, um, all of the other programs, we want them to be successful. And we also have a small um, uh, graduating class too. Um, we'll tell you, I don't know if I should start in on that now or. Yeah, yeah, you can, because I'm gonna ask this question because I know sometimes you have students who just, because you all have nurtured them and taken care of them, they said, well, I don't wanna leave. I don't want to go, <laughs> you know, and, you know, because they, they feel a love and they feel a support. So how do you, I mean, you don't really want to kick them out, kick them out, but you say, you know, you have to leave. <laughs> how yeah. do you all handle that? Well, we were actually just talking about that. You're right. That some of them don't want to go. Um, but the beauty of having now ESL in every school, we know from day one, we can look at a student's address. You're going to Doss High School. You're going to you know, PRP or Ballard or wherever, and they will have ESL services for them when they move out. So um, our counselors have been working with students, letting them know, you know, these are your schools. They're researching mm -hmm. those schools. We're really, you know, letting them, we, we started a Paxton Patterson lab, career exploration, so that students can get ready to move out into um, the academies of Louisville and know what's offered in their reside school. But we're really focusing on that and we want to have even more come in um, as far as, you know, just more connections with those schools. I also communicate with the principals of those schools to let them know the progress of their students and just to provide them a list. Here are the students in your resides area. Here's how they're doing. Um, here's their address. Go ahead and contact them or, you know, however that they want to connect as well. We have some future things that we'll be doing too, um, connecting with parents um, even more. We write, we've written several letters already to parents to let them know the process. Um, 
as well. So we're doing everything we can to help them to transition quickly and easily and comfortably. That's the big thing is that they're comfortable and they feel safe. And I just wanted to add to this, Gwen, that we do such a great job here preparing students for their reside schools that they actually get excited about it. And last week, remember, Gwen, you and I were talking about a student. He created a Twitter account and he followed all of us on Twitter. We're all big Twitter fans here. Mm -hmm. And he wrote future Eastern high school students. So he researched his future school, his sports that he wants to play there. So it was pretty cute. He felt very happy and comfortable moving on in the summer to different most, schools. Most of yes. the people do want to move on. But fortunately, we do have the A to G program. And I really want Rita to talk about that because it's a nice program for our students. And so the A to G program, our Accelerate to Graduate uh, uh, program, uh, I guess it's been in existence now going on our third year, but it is our second year of having the district level A to G program that Iroquois High School once housed. And uh, that program is designed to meet the needs of those high school seniors who are about to age out and whose uh, level of English language acquisition or credits uh, would hinder them graduating in a regular comprehensive program. And so uh, students that meet the criteria of having uh, you know, at least 10 credits uh, as well as having have successfully passed ESL uh, one, are uh, uh, enrolled in the program, and uh, they are able to make up and recover those remaining uh, credits through uh, standards-based grading and instruction. And this year we have our uh, largest class of 37 students, okay. which is really exciting. Yeah. Uh, Ms. Snow, you can go on with the presentation. I know you've been in and out, so you can. Oh, let's see. Um, we just had, we're just kind of highlighting, we knew you'd be talking about certain parts, so we just wanted to interact that. Um, I think we've got a lot of that actually. Um, so yeah, we're super excited about A to G Accelerate to Graduate um, and what that offers our students and connecting them on also with the Evolve 502 and with um, JCTC um, and opportunities for them to continue on once they, they leave our school and be part of our um, larger community. So you have a partnership with them? Um JCTC? They've come in already um, and have met with our students. Um, we they were helping with FAFSA. We've had a few organizations coming in and working with students, helping them fill out forms and just explain. It's you can imagine it's completely new and you know bizarre for some of our students and their parents. They it's just different from what they've experienced in their countries. So we want to make sure that they have all of this information. Um, we also collaborate with Kentuckiana Works for those students whose uh, post-secondary goals, you know, will consist of, you know, seeking employment. So, um, for those students in Zimbabwe, Kentuckiana Works, because we know there are so many different career options, not just going to, you know, post-secondary, but the opportunity to be able to be involved in some of the, um, the other programs, whether it's HVAC, electrician, welding, all those, uh, do they get exposed to those opportunities to say, you don't have to go to a four-year college to be successful. There are other opportunities. Yes, and they uh, find those not only through the collaboration with JCTC, but also as I shared with Kentucky Anna Works, in, in addition to Job Corps, Mm -hmm. okay. okay. So they're connected, so you all are connected with Job Corps as well? Yes, yes. 
they have uh, spoken with our kids uh, twice already this school year, and then they'll be uh, speaking with them again uh, virtually this semester for those students uh, whose plans are not a four-year school. I, I also would like to say something as in regarding to the eighth graders. They, um, every year in the first semester, they participate in JA Inspire um, with the district and with all different uh, different businesses. It's a, a partnership with different businesses, different local organizations that um, pretty much come to the venue. They go to a venue, a large venue, but this it's been online, of course, for the past couple of years. But they learn about the different career clusters. There's different 16 different career clusters. They complete a career assessment. They find out which career is best for for them that they that they would be most interested in. So it's it's very individualized. And then they visit different workshops and they visit different vendors to learn more about the different careers that are available for them. And then from that, as they are completing their applications for different schools that they're interested in, they're able to take that information and really focus on the schools that provide coursework within those careers that they are interested in. We also are tying in, we've applied to be um, an explorer um, academy school through the middle school zone and we um, started up this Paxton Patterson lab to tie in with the academies of Louisville throughout JCPS. Students do an ILP, an individual learning plan um, when they enter and we also just ask them like be very attribute, attribute based, um, look at what skills they already have, what are they interested in and build that, especially you see our Accelerate to Graduate program does that a lot where they find out what students know what they can do, what kind of learning can we build so that we build on you know, what students bring to the classroom and what their interests are. Um, they're very personalized as far as the learning uh, goes. And you see that throughout the school for sure, but especially in that Accelerate to Graduate program, I think that's pretty fantastic. So. Dr. McGrath, you, you spoke about earlier about the Racial Equity Committee. How are you looking at curriculum and to ensure that students see individuals who look like them or is that uh, topic of conversation or what's going on with that? Yes, it's actually one of our goals this um, school year is to make sure that all our teachers and bilingual associate instructors, and we have a lot of new people uh, this school year that they participate in PD and coaching sections on selecting and creating curriculum materials that are accurately reflect the contributions of cultures represented in, um, by newcomer students and their uh, families. So we are um, doing very targeted um, professional developments here in school. We're having conversations with students because, I mean, we're all very much familiar with the concept of mirrors and windows, right? So when we read a book, we either see ourselves in it, it's, it's a mirror, or we learn about other people's experiences in it, and it's a window into someone else's lives. So we wanna make sure that our students see themselves in everything that um, we, well, in most everything that we use in our classrooms, but including assessments, because sometimes I feel like um, we do a really good job of offering um, textbook materials or um, books um, that students can easily relate to, but maybe not necessarily when we um, offer them different formative or summative assessments. And so that's why we created this sort of tool. It's a special tool that we use to ensure that our um, assessment is equitable um, and inclusive. So we're very specific about it and do um, meet with teachers, discuss it, share, have conversations, and that's our focus. Okay, I do. Um, uh, Ms. Snow, did we go, did we get to all of the slides? Because we need to go through. Oh, you're, you're mute. mute. You're on mute. Sorry. Um, that's the first time I did that. That's good. Um, yeah, we pretty much, we just brought some slides in addressing you know, some of the questions that we thought would come up. So we're good on that. Ms. Snow, could you uh, 
show them the language slide. Oh, thank you. I knew there was one. <laughs> we, uh, as of this week, we have 23 different languages. Of course, Spanish is our top language and Kenyawanda is the second, um, but it's amazing the different languages that come to newcomer. And one of the good things that JCPS does, they allow us to have a tool language line, either on a computer or I have it on my cell phone. And it used to be, we would have to pull our bilingual associates uh, in to translate when we needed to talk to our students. Well, now we just, we, we can have any language we want at any time using our language line and those, uh, BAIs can stay in the classroom and support mm -hmm. the students in the classroom rather than being a counseling session for 30 to 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. So, and we can call parents. The communication that we have now mm -hmm. with parents mm -hmm. that we didn't used to have is amazing. Okay. And it's called a language line? Uh-huh. Yeah. One, of the, oh, one of the things that evolved out of um, NTI, uh, the remote instruction, was it's getting very familiar with using Google Meets or, you know, like Zoom, things like that. And we found um, connecting with parents, especially if they're newcomers, if you have just moved to the United States and you're just getting started, you might be working a lot, you have a lot of stress, you have childcare, getting parents into school meetings and talking with parents can be a challenge sometimes. Um, we would go all out before, have bus transportation and tra uh, translation and babysitters and, you know, all sorts of stuff we would look at it, getting parents in. Now with Google Meets, we have a town hall session once a month in different languages, Kinyarwanda and Swahili and Spanish, and just go to the parents. They sign into their child's Chromebook. All the students have a Chromebook and a hotspot, and they can just, we can present different topics or they can have Q&A with us, just like we're doing here. Um, but with the support of translation, uh, it just makes it really easy. So they don't have to worry about you know, those extra things. You know, who's watching the kid or how do I get there? Or, you know, how long will it take me to get home? Um, it's just right there. So I think that's, and the students can be right alongside of them if they like or not, um, but it makes it very easy. That's one of the things about the pandemic is that we've been able to learn how to use, a better use Zoom and Teams and Google Meets and, all those platforms that we should continue to use in some instances um, because everyone cannot get to one space, you know, because of parking, because of childcare, because of various different things. And those platforms allow us to be able to do that. I think something else that evolved out of NTI too, I don't know if Rebecca talked about it too much, but um, it's really exciting. Uh, we jumped into standards-based grading last year um, just because it just went hand in hand with what we were doing. We needed to do it probably all along and it was the perfect opportunity to do it. Um, and it's really made a big difference as far as helping our students to accelerate their learning instead of you know always just being behind, we're able to just help them catch up. Mm -hmm. Glenn, I was gonna, I was just about to pop into that because I thought that was a nice bridge between what you were sharing about the advancements of NTI and what Irina shared about the equity piece and um, some advancements that we are super proud of as a school as being a leader in the district with interdisciplinary learning. We were able to, during the first round of NTI or maybe the second, I don't know, all the NTIs are blending together. We know this one's short, so we don't have to panic about this one. Um, but in last year's school year, we put our heads together to figure out how we could help students be successful wherever they were. And because our teachers were organized by teams, we developed a system where teachers could work together on interdisciplinary units, not new, right? That's not new, but man, NTI made it easy. And through the use of Google Docs and those shared hyperdocs, we were able to coach our teachers to, and I'll, I'll give credit to a teacher, Mr. Joel Giro, who is um, an arts and humanities teacher here, but in a PLC, he called it grab the grade, right? Like when they're in there and you see students being successful at a standard that applies to your content in these meets and in these units, Let's snatch that opportunity because why do, do kids have to demonstrate only in math a math skill? If the English project involves calculating a budget to release a book, why not grab that math standard and say, hey, wait a minute, we got it right here. Because learning doesn't have to be so isolated. And then from that developed um, some really rich work around standards-based teaching and learning. Um, super proud of that work. Uh, some of the work I'm most proud of as a school and because of that work, our sixth grade team, 
So we have four teachers on that team. It's our smallest team. Um, four fantastic, amazing, incredible, innovative teachers that took a leap and applied collectively as a team to be part of a competency-based education program and are seeking coursework, um, maybe at a different university, but coursework nonetheless, and are working together to obtain, um, you know, to obtain their rank one through that program and teach everything in an interdisciplinary fashion, everything around standards. And that came from them seeing the amazing impact and how it created a level of equitable access. It put those boxes under the feet of students that could easily be adjusted so that every kid could in fact be an active learner. And when they saw that, they said, we can, we should be doing this. And so now they are also leaders in passing the torch. So incredibly proud of that work and how we brought it back, back into the classroom. Now, um, when we are in person in these few days that we're in NTI, our kids have not missed a beat. We've had great attendance and great engagement because kids are used to it. And to piggyback on what Rebecca is saying, it's also um, made a huge difference in our students' attitudes towards learning and the excitement that they show. And they show up every day in Google Classrooms and do the work and they're excited to participate, whether they're in person or they're doing it virtually. And I feel like that's because of the work that we have um, done. They are not afraid to make mistakes. They want to learn. They're excited about learning. Another system we have in place, uh, Dr. Starks, is um, we have uh, multi, uh, the MTSS support for students that are not progressing, and we are able to identify them if they're special ed before they leave us, or we can get them in the referral process before they leave us, because uh, many students in their country, we had a student one time that came to us that was blind that wasn't allowed to go to school in his country mm -hmm. because he was blind you know mm -hmm. so when they're when they have a disability a lot of times in their country they don't get to go to school mm -hmm. so we help big goal, yeah. them. our big goal is that they're prepared to transition no matter what so if it's having you know extra supports as they transition out or the language is up to speed or whatever it is they need to help them to transition successfully mm -hmm. you know in that you know, sometimes students, because they have not gone to school or because they don't speak the language and they, people even they want to put them in the special ed, well, they're not, they don't belong in special ed, it's just a language barrier, you know, you know or they have not been in school, but they, they can think, they can learn, but just given the opportunity to be able to do that. Dr. Stark, I wanted to piggyback just one more thing. And yet you're right, Gwen, I'm a talker. And Alethea, yeah, I've been learning. You're a talker too. And I love it. I love seeing this. Yes. Of you. It's no, yes. We don't get to talk, right? Sometimes we don't get to talk like this. Um, something else I think I, I want to make sure, and I know this is important to everyone here, while some of our students do not have access to education and some of our students have not had those opportunities, many of our students bring, all of them bring a wealth of knowledge. And I think something that's really important to note is many of our students are gifted and talented. We try very hard to help them dig in and showcase the things that they do bring. Um, it's, it's very easy to approach um, any other as a, in a deficit-based uh, mentality, and that is not something that, that we do. And I would hate for everyone to walk away with the impression that, that we do that. Because not every, many of our students come from rich backgrounds with parents who have high-level degrees. They are um, skilled. They have many things to offer. And it's, it is simply acquiring a basic level of English so that they can compete beside their peers and be active participants. So something that I know everyone on this on this panel is very, very proud of is the way that we really do try to um, bring out the best in every kid and see the best in every student. Because being multilingual, you know, if you're me, you're, you're a white woman, being multilingual is, is like, wow, you know, look at you speak two languages. But we need to be very careful to promote that people of color who speak more than one language Wow, and many of our students speak many languages. Mm -hmm. And so we have to actively promote that in the community in the way that we talk to our peers, in the way that we talk out in the public, um, in the way that we also coach up our students because we would hate for them to see their first, second, third, fourth, fifth language in any way as a deficit. It is an asset and, and you should be proud of it. So I think that's very, very important. And, and you're absolutely right, you know, because um... How many times have we seen on TV where people are speaking um, in their language, in various languages 
to other people that they know or their family member or friends. And someone says, you know, if you can't speak English, then you need to leave this country or, you know, speak English. I'm just rude, you know, and again, not looking at that as, you know, as an asset, but looking at it as a deficit because we as Americans, you know, most of us only know one language, you know, and so, but being able to let those individuals know you are special, the fact that you are able to speak more than one language, that's an asset, that's a gift that many of us doesn't have, many, many of us do not have, but many times people want to put people down as a result of that. So, but to praise them and honor them is, is important, yes. Yeah, and the district is beginning to recognize that by allowing for, this will be the first year for it, for students to get a uh, seal on their high school diploma. If they can show proficiency, uh, you know, uh, oh, in the, in English, in addition to uh, any other languages they know. And right now we have uh, two kiddos in our A to G program who are working towards uh, getting that seal. And I believe that they will uh, obtain it. Mm -hmm. And just, just a wonderful sense of confidence and sense of pride that that brings, because if you just allow people to have a sense of belonging then they can do whatever they want to do, then I mean, the sky's the limit but just having that basic sense of belonging of people who believe in them. I mean, you all are clearly demonstrating that you know, to, um, to newcomer students. Ms. Snow, you want to say something? Yeah, so one thing we also do to help students feel you know, proud of their multilingual backgrounds and feel comfortable is also our staffing. Um, about, I'd say one third of our teaching staff um, started out as paraprofessionals um, in the field and it's you know they started out as bilingual associate instructors or a clerk um, and you know just that attitude when they're working in a school we know that they're interested in education and so promoting that do they have a certification from their country or do they want to do alternative certification um, but to be here they they are already driven by the mission that we have um, over half of our staff started out at, um, started out in the United States as newcomers themselves maybe as a young child or more recently but they know um, what it's like, or they might have lived in a situation um, in another country, you know, also just the similar thing. So when our students see that in the staff around them and the staff understand that, that is very dynamic and it helps the students feel, you know, comfortable and safe and um, making those connections with the adults in the building. Um, and it's very important, we continue to do that. We just hired a, a wonderful new batch of bilingual associate instructors and are looking at how to promote their, um, under, you know, just getting them to be ready to teach in JCPS classrooms as soon as possible. Um, some extra supports that we're giving them in the classrooms here, giving them chances to try out instruction themselves with support of um, other teachers to mentor them. So we, we continue to build that and we know that that's gonna be very helpful, not only here in Newcomer, but throughout JCPS. Our students will see them every day. Absolutely, you know, and as I stated earlier about, um, we, need, we need teachers, you know, not only um, black teachers, but we also need teachers of color, you know, and so that if those students are able to see that, or you, or someone's able to say, we need you, we want you, because we know as kids, we all played school, they probably play in school at some point as well, you know, then let's build on that foundation of being able to continue to do school, because all too often people, they get the negativity, oh, you don't want to be a teacher, blah, 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 blah. But we need them. And it's, of course, um, many of them still have the aspiration. And when I was over the, the sub-center, I mean, I saw many people who want to become teachers, but were distracted because people were indicated that you don't want to be, become a teacher. But yet, after a career later, they were looking at a second career because that's, it wasn't what they wanted to do. So they were in careers and trying to transition. So... You know, as we are right now with a shortage of teachers, then please emphasize to them and, and talk about education. And, and I think what you all are, are exemplifying to them, then they can be that nurturer as well to someone else, you know, as well being able to reach back and say, um, as the, the staff at Newcomer has given to them, then they can give those same, the same love and attention to someone else, you know, as well. You, know. you all mentioned that there was an advisory committee, um, and I know in a number of schools, I mean, how large is that committee? Because in a number of schools, they have like a 
Black Student Union. I mean, do, do you all have like a student union where they students can can have voice and 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 more than and what's and what's the capacity? What's the number of students involved in in that group? Currently, it's nine students. Each counselor picked. Um, Felicia, since I know you know the numbers, how many co cohorts would you say that we have? Because there's a representation of a student from each cohort that the counselor has. Uh, well, we have 17 high school cohorts, but uh, our teachers are in like one through five, all the same teachers are teaching them, six through um, nine, all the same teachers are teaching them. So we uh, picked students from our cohorts. Right to participate that we thought would be a good voice and good representation for mm -hmm. their peers. Mm -hmm. Or they we also have to go back and talk to their peers and say, hey, these are some of the things that we're working on, that these are, you know, that they're able to hear from their peers in terms of some of the things that they would like to see or changes or things that they would want to just, you know, yes. see happen. Yeah. Yes. Miss no I think Miss Noah is going to say, yeah. say something. So there's also, um, we also have a Black Student Union for middle school and high school as well. Um, so, you know, we have that ongoing and they work with, it's kind of a hybrid blend because transportation sometimes can be an issue after school. So they meet during the day and then they do use Google Meets after school um, to continue that connection there. And um, that's strong. We kind of, we started doing kind of a, uh, one of our teachers, maybe about five or six years ago, started a Swahili men of quality. We remembered the men of quality right. that we had yes. at Western, mm -hmm. and um, yes. he did specifically as we were growing our Congolese population. He wanted to pull mm -hmm. together the young men and um, work with them. And he worked a lot with um, Kirk Lattimore too. Um, mm -hmm. And just anyway, that was really nice. So they they continue to do that. Yeah, great. There was also a. I'm oh, sorry. We know that that's that's very very important to have that, and I know as we have the men of quality. I, I think I'm thinking about Miss Curry, Valerie Curry, who is at at Western, and she had uh, ladies. I forgot what they divas or something, but you know, you know, it was a female group. You know, right now we know that females have the least sense of belonging, you know, as well. So, um, so just I'm not sure if you all have a female group. But, women of worth. Okay. Miss Curry was women of worth. Okay. Mm -hmm. There was a question asked um, in the question and answers that I'd like to answer for this person. Okay. Uh, they asked, uh, can any newcomers come to Newcomer Academy? Well, students that um, we have students sixth through 12th grade, and they have to go to the ESL intake office first, take the WIDA test. If they score under a 2.5, they are placed here. If they score over a 2.5, but under a 4.5, they're ES. L students and they go to their reside school from the ESL intake office. They're the ones that does the placement. Okay. Another question that was uh, asked in the Q and A box that I wanted to uh, address was regarding: uh, Do we take into account the level of education that our students and their native language that they come in with? And we do. Uh, that information is on the student's PSP program services plan, and it uh, gives us information on uh, how to place them academically. And for the high school students where those courses are credit uh, bearing, particularly in the content areas of science and math, those credits often transfer from their countries. But one of the rules JCPS has if they come to newcomer, they have to get four credits in English. So even if they bring, I mean, that's two years in school right there, because mm -hmm. even if you went in the summer, you have to have four credits in English to graduate and you can't bring an English credit from your country. So, mm -hmm. And that's why it's good that we have the A to G program because some students, they come here and they're 19 years old and they have to get finished by before they're 21 or they don't get to finish JCPS. There's another question in the question box about how is security handled differently than at other JCPS schools? 
Um, I know Rebecca can probably add to this, but they ask, how do you select and train security people to deal with students with trauma and inappropriate languages? We have a fantastic um, in-school security monitor who is, he doesn't just stand there with his arms crossed looking for something to happen. He is very proactive. I mean, he thinks of all of the students as honestly like his kids, basically. And he will, he knows what's going on. He has his, you know, a pulse on what students are thinking and what they're doing. He is a um, Spanish speaker, so he's able to connect with the 70% of students that speak Spanish very quickly, um, but also just very open-minded to all languages, of course, too, that our students need. Um, and once again, he has that background and perspective. You know, he's new here to this community. He understands some of the same things. His, um, you know, his kids are in ESL programs. His, his daughter was in our school several years ago. Um, so, I mean, it's just that connection there that is very proactive um, and, you know, a wonderful thing. I think for a security guard, honestly, in any school, not just our school, um, is, is a great way to, to deal with situations and to prevent things from happening. It's about prevention. And also, yeah, and also to build those relationships um, that all too often, once they're in the community, it can be very, very negative, you know, they can have a ne negative perception based on what they see on TV, because of course, 99% of what they see on TV is gonna be negative of the interaction with police officers. So being able to establish those relationships early on, or even that mindset, you know, it, it, it's wonderful. Yeah, it's great. Previously, we had a really powerful program. Um, we collaborated with the FBI and the LMPD to build positive rapport. That's been more of a challenge just in the current political climate with you know lack of funding and lack of access and those folks being pulled for other things. Um, but that is something certainly very valuable for our students to learn. Um, Luis is amazing. He really is. He's second to none. And I would say 90% of behavior or any issues we might have, he's addressed and, I, and we don't ever hear about them. And that's fine by me. You know, he, he takes care of it, nips it in the bud, builds that rapport with kids. He was actually on the phone today calling some, some students who are struggling just, just to check in and say, hey, I'm worried about you. you know, I haven't seen you in class. Are you doing okay? Um, and so that, that is so powerful. Absolutely. And the students from the various countries, how are they connecting with each other? How do they, because I know there's turf wars and different things that happen, but, but how do they, how, how are they coming together as one um, newcomer group? And, and I ask that question because there's a story that just hangs in my mind when I was at, when we were at Western when it was a, a black female student, well, they were, they were riding the bus and the young lady got off the bus and she just came to me, you know, she was mad and she was angry because the bus driver had told an ESL student that they didn't speak English, they couldn't talk on the bus. And that was a, a shining moment for me because I saw students taking care of other students. And I saw that student was connected with that student and say, that bus driver could not talk to her like that. And I was happy that she came to me <laughs> before she blasted the bus driver, but it was a show that, a demonstration that, that there were, the camaraderie was there, the love was there, the support for each other was there. And that's something that's, that's, um, that was um, a shining moment for me to know that, okay, it is happening, it is working, not only with staff, but also with students. Yeah, I think building that community, creating a community where everyone has something, you know, in common, we're the newcomer academy and they're newcomers first, you know, they are themselves, but we're all here, you know, we all have a common mission and goal. I think, I know Rebecca and Rita and I, we all learned that early on in our teaching career at Western too. It's just like build that common community because when you start having this group and that group, then especially teenagers, they just, well, even adults, they keep splitting up and splitting up. So if you have that commonality and make lots of opportunities for students to get to know each other and to learn from each other and learn with each other. That's so powerful um, the whole way through. So, you know, always just mixing up the groups and making sure everybody knows everybody in the class um, as opposed to just having that other where you can start, you know, turning that into something else. Um, and I, you just explained that there too, from that example at Western, I think, where they had that commonality and they took up for each other. Yeah. As yeah, we're even scheduling, I'm sorry, as we're even scheduling students, you know, we're collaboratively working with the teachers 
to really pay attention to that as well, to making sure that the classes are, um, that they are diversified with students from various countries. So it's not just one whole group, you know, and um, that helps with the students being able to really get to know each other and realize there's a lot of similarities that they have with one another so that they can connect and relate to each other. So that it, it starts from the beginning, from the moment that they come in and ensuring that they are, that they are really all mixed together. And I also feel like it's so natural to all of our teachers to immediately build community and do activities with our students that they feel comfortable with each other, that they get to know each other and build those relationships. It's just such an integral part of every classroom here. And every student is a newcomer. So they know like a brand new student will be on the bus and they figure out that they're new and they'll walk them in the school and get them to where they need to go. I mean, they're they're everyone. That's not just an individual situation. That just happens every day. Okay. Ms. Robinson, you want to say something? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was just going to, you know, just uh, reiterate what others have said. It, it truly is a, a village concept uh, here in terms of our intentional efforts to support and reach out to families and students. And yeah, and we uh, we bring our experiences uh, from Western to that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, good day. I, I want to thank you all for being here, and I tell you, it warms my heart because to be able to see, um, you know, Miss Snow, Miss Session, and Miss Merkel to be able to continue the legacy, you know, that we had at Western. Because when I went there, it wasn't there. It wasn't that, but to build that culture and climate. And to be that's very very necessary and to be able to see you all continue that and know the value of that uh, and what it brings to that is just um it's just heartwarming and so i'm happy <laughs> to that that you all are you know that i've played a little role in, in that in being able to see uh, what you all are doing right now is is wonderful and it's amazing thank you for inviting us mm -hmm. well, thank absolutely you. absolutely and Again, um, for those, and there were many people who um, indicated that they couldn't be here for whatever reason, um, but they, um, but they will, um, the video will be available on the Nice Trans Center. And if anyone that you all know who couldn't be here for whatever reason, it's on the Nice Trans Center website, all the videos, all the, the speaker series sessions are there. And you all will be at the top since you all just completing this today. So. Again, thank you all and um, um, appreciate it. And any parting words from you are, any, any lasting words that you are comments you would like to make? Glad that we have this great leadership team here and this opportunity to share um, what we do and what our teachers and staff do uh, every day. It's definitely uh, a work of the heart. So. Yeah, but, but it's your leadership. I mean, the leadership that you all bring to the table it doesn't happen automatically. It has to be intentional. And for you all to come together as one and to provide that leadership because those four teachers that Ms. Merkel spoke of, then they've had to have the culture and climate have to be conducive for them to do that, to want to do that. The racial equity committee, the amazing work that they're doing, the culture and climate has to be that in order for that to, to build and that the nurturing has to be there. And you all have provided that. So. Again, kudos to you all for your leadership. And if there's anything that I can do to um, support then any of you all, then just know that I'm a, a phone call away. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Stark. Absolutely. So with that being said, that's that ends our series for today and uh, you know, on time. So thank you all and have a happy new year. Thank you. Thank you. Happy new year. Thank you.